Hello, I'm Brad Allenby. I'm the Lincoln Professor of Engineering and Ethics, and I'm also President's Professor of Engineering in the School of Sustainable Engineering in the Built Environment. Uh, what I'd like to talk about today is a concept called moral injury. Uh, because this is probably new to many of you, uh, let me first define it. Moral injury is debilitating psychological or spiritual damage that results from the transgression of deeply held moral beliefs and expectations. We're studying it, that is, uh, myself um, uh, and colleagues uh, in Australia and uh, the United Kingdom, we're studying this uh, in warriors and people who have been exposed to combat and to war. Uh, the reason is that, that uh, it's very common. Uh, it's been recognized for centuries indeed for uh, millennia. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is from uh, uh, Sophocles' play Ajax, uh, where he's talking about Ajax, the hero, one of the heroes of the Trojan War when he gets home. Uh, for our fierce hero sits, shell-shocked in his tent, blazed over, gazing into oblivion, he has the thousand-yard stare. The thousand-yard stare is a phenomenon that people have associated with returning warriors uh, for a long time. Uh, in the United States, uh, it became uh, very well known in World War II and of course in Korea and, and in Vietnam and in other, uh, other wars. Uh, it's important to understand from the beginning that moral injury is different than PTSD. PTSD is a recognized psychological uh, and trauma-based phenomenon. And we have and are developing ways in which PTSD can be treated. One of the reasons it's important to understand that moral injury, which is essentially damage to your personal identity, damage to your soul, if you will. One of the reasons that moral identity is different is that the treatments that work for PTSD do not work for moral injury, which means that you need to differentiate the two if you're going to uh, treat people who have moral injury, if you're going to help their families, if you're going to help their communities, uh, respond to the challenges of moral injury. In some ways, moral injury is important because it's, it's an information disease. All of us have identities which are built uh, of narratives, of habit patterns, of things that our religion has taught us, things that our, our uh, community has taught us, family traditions, all of us are very complex structures that are built up over a long period of time and held together usually by implicit levels of narratives and of understanding of what is right and wrong and what we are uh, that define us. When we do things, and this is of course common in combat, combat is a situation that humans were never designed to be in, if you will, uh, when the, the, you experience certain things in combat, what you do is you knock out some of those fundamental and implicit assumptions about identity. One of the most powerful words in the battlefield as well as any place else is, we don't do that. And when that's violated, when that we is violated, when you fall out of your community, you fall out of your identity, then you have moral injury. Now, the reason this is important is that identity is becoming a battle space. That is to say, we are learning to attack and to manipulate identity in ways that were not possible before we had social media, before we had uh, big data and analytics that allowed us to, to identify those spaces where you might be particularly prone uh, to moral injury. So it's important to understand both in a, um, in a sense of treatment, that is to say those who have moral injury should be helped to overcome it, particularly because in many cases the reason they have moral injury is because civilian society sent them to do something uh, that civilian society 
thought should be done and then treats them with disdain when they come back. Moral injury in that sense is, a, uh, is a, an injury of war that needs to be managed, needs to be fixed. But moral injury is also a potentially exploitable weakness if you have sophisticated disinformation and weaponized narrative tools. And so from both an offense and a defense perspective, both from a treatment and a resilience perspective, moral injury becomes a very serious issue uh, for uh, not just the military, but for the country that sends that military out uh, into the world uh, to, do its, uh, to do its fighting. As we go through the rest of this, think about the connection between narrative, uh, weaponized narrative, that is the use of narrative to achieve uh, political uh, or, or uh, geopolitical uh, goals, and the identities of the individuals that are involved. And think also, perhaps, of the Vietnam experience, where we sent a lot of young people, often out of high school, often without much training at all in the kinds of conditions they were going to face, into horrific uh, war conditions. And then, when they came back, we called them baby killers. So what we did was we sent people into conditions that we should have known if we didn't know, we're going to damage them, and then we brought them back, uh, and we damaged them further. Fortunately, we're not doing that today, but it pays to remember how little we really understand about this and how badly we have behaved in the past uh, in hopes that we can do better in the future. So the, the moral injury issue extends from the personal level, that is the identity of the individual, to the cultural level. Uh, and the, the best example of this, I think, is the French. Uh, it's uh, beyond most, uh, most of our historical memories, but Algeria was once a part of France. And I don't mean it was a colony of France. I mean, the French regarded it as part of France. Uh, there were a lot of French settlers in Algeria who had been there decades, uh, if not longer. The uh, FLN was a, we would call them now, a terrorist organization that, uh, uh, that grew up to wrest Algeria away from uh, the French. At first, the French did very badly in that battle. They sent, they sent their airborne troops, they sent the Foreign Legion, but they did badly. But uh, there was a French strategist, Roger Trinquier, who developed what turned out to be a very effective strategy. In fact, his strategy uh, allowed the French to beat the FLN. It involved, among other things, torture and summary executions. It was a very brutal strategy, but it worked. And the French achieved a military victory. However, the brutality that was involved, the fact that what the French had done, had the, they'd fallen from that, we don't do that, resulted in the overthrow of the French government. Uh, the Fourth Republic fell. Uh, de Gaulle was installed as the new leader, and France lost Algeria. De Gaulle gave up Algeria. Generals almost mounted a successful coup against him because he did that, which shows you the depth of emotion that involved it, that involved um, Algeria for the French. But the important point to notice is that what what the strategy had done is it had been very it had been effective and it had been nothing more than the terrorists were doing in fact it was less than what the terrorists were doing but it was not what the french could accept as being part of the french identity and because of that algeria fell and because of that france lost algeria and their government so the idea of moral injury at an individual level is coupled to ideas and identities that involve everything up to and including uh, the state and the culture. Uh, Snowden is a good example in the United States. 
To many people, Snowden is a hero because he revealed that NSA was spying on Americans and on, on the leaders of Germany and so forth. However, Snowden also was a major enabler of the Crimean invasion. Without Snowden's information, it would have been more difficult for Putin to drive a wedge, particularly between the Germans and the Americans, who are core to NATO, and in doing so mean that NATO's response to the Ukrainian invasion was not as coordinated uh, or as effective as perhaps it might have been. It was a very, very effective use of um, uh, Snowden. Now, whether Snowden intended that or not uh, is unknown, and I doubt we'll ever know. Uh, but the fact that he enabled that kind of response, that kind of attack on identity is important. Because what he was really doing, what his information really did, what Putin really said was, you're doing this. Is this what Americans do? And to the Germans, the answer was no. This is not what friends do with each other. So to think of this in individual terms is critical because the individual suffers from moral injury. To understand this as part of a much broader interplay where identity becomes a battle space is also important because you have different ethical issues that arise at all those levels. So why are US warriors particularly at risk today? Uh, one of the things that's interesting to anybody that works in this area is we've known about this for hundreds of years, for thousands of years. Why has it taken us so long to try to respond to moral injury in American warriors? Part of that is that the mission that American warriors now have to carry out is much, much more complicated and it involves different identities. If you're in a firefight, your identity is that of warrior and you have signed up for that and you kill and sometimes you're killed. If, however, your job is to police, for example, a city in Iraq, then you're not operating under those rules and you can't operate under that culture. Your culture has to be one of policing, which is a very different culture. And if you're assigned, say, as a special ops operative to help uh, build a community, then it's an entirely different identity. So part of what has been going on with the American military in particular is that as the number of missions begins to multiply, the number of identities that is required begins to multiply. And this opens up the potential for significant serious damage because you've already weakened the uh, single identity of warrior which was possible in the past. The other thing is that the U.S., more than any other country, has to operate in very, very different cultures. The idea that this world has just one culture is simply false. Uh, we like to think that Western values are universal. Uh, that is not accepted by um, many organizations in Islam. It's not accepted by the Russians. It's not accepted by the Chinese. Uh, it's a comfortable myth for the Europeans and the Americans, but it's a myth. America operates in something like 140 countries. We have troops operating in 140 countries. For comparison, I think there's something like 195 countries in the world. 140 countries is 140 different cultures. It's different cultures you have to learn to operate in, it's different cultures you have to be comfortable in, and it's different cultures where you have to retain your own identity while working closely with people who may have very different identities, may have very different values, and yet you are their ally. And you may find yourself in some very uncomfortable positions as a result. And you can be damaged and you may come home with that damage. Certainly that's happened in Iraq and Afghanistan. Finally, there's the whole issue of moral values as soft power. That is to say, um, does the United States have a higher uh, ability to project American values and ideals in the world because it is recognized as adhering to higher morals. It's interesting if you look at, for example, Syria. You find a strong asymmetry in the way that different countries are criticized and the way they react to the criticism. If America bombs something that they shouldn't, then um, they are attacked by NGOs uh, and 
uh, they usually investigate the issue. If the Russians do, uh, there's usually no investigation and it's not clear that the Russians are terribly bothered by it. In some ways, it's a double standard. The question is, does the double standard make America more powerful or less powerful? And that's, of course, an interesting question. What are some of the ethical implications? Well, the most obvious ethical implication is that there's no question that the United States is failing and has failed its military. Uh, we send young, often impressionable uh, people off to war, put them in situations that are psychologically extraordinarily difficult, uh, where it is quite possible that they will be psychologically impacted, and they often are. Then we bring them home and we tend to ignore, or in the case of Vietnam, even despise them. Uh, one of the questions that has come up, I've, since I've researched in this area, I've talked to a number of, of uh, serving and, and um, uh, ex-service people who have been in these kinds of situations. One of the questions that comes up is, um, and it's not so much a question as a sad realization that American society doesn't want to know what war actually is. They want, to, they want to win wars, they want to send people off, they want to do these wars, but they don't want to know what war really is. They don't want to know that you have to kill civilians. They don't want to know what that feels like. And they certainly don't want to have to talk to an individual who comes back with that burden about what actually happened when they were at war. So the question is, and that's understandable to some extent, civil society is remarkably uh, and increasingly uh, separate from uh, any kind of, of knowledge of military organizations or institutions or culture or identity. Uh, but the question is, is that a good thing for society? Is it an ethical position to send somebody off to do that kind of work and then to pretend you don't want to know about it? The second is an operational question in applied ethics. Are there ways that we can train young people to be more resilient to this kind of damage, and yet at the same time not to lose their humanity, not to lose their connection back to civil society, not to stop being we? We don't do that. In other words, can you build resilient warriors that can manage the stress that combat inevitably creates better than we do now? The answer to that is probably yes, simply because we haven't paid a lot of attention to it. And we certainly don't pay too much attention to it when warriors get back. So the answer to that is probably yes, but we're not doing that. That at some point becomes close to an ethical imperative. Finally, the linkage between applied ethics and moral injury is almost complete. Moral injury is in some sense an injury to ethics, an injury to morality, an injury to identity. Um, and so because of all of those implications, moral injury is a serious challenge to the sort of saccharine applied ethics that we generally tend to talk about. In the real world, when people have moral injury, they damage their family. They beat their wives. They kill themselves. And we do nothing about it. Thank you.